The Commonwealth is a voluntary association of 54 independent states, working together towards shared goals of democracy, development and peace. Member countries span six continents and oceans, from Africa to Asia, the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe and the South Pacific. The Commonwealth is seen as a special family, a family of nations. The country of Antigua and Barbuda is located in the heart of the Caribbean between the Greater and the Lesser Antilles. The largest of the English-speaking Leeward Islands, Antigua has low rainfall and is generally flat, with mostly limestone formations, sandy soil and scrub vegetation. With a population of just over 85,000 people and an economy mainly reliant on tourism, Antigua is about 108 square miles. Barbuda, on the other hand, is a flat coral island of about 62 square miles and lies north of Antigua. Largely undeveloped, its endless pink and white sand beaches are protected by barrier reefs, and in the northwest lagoon lies one of the region's significant frigate bird sanctuaries. Antigua prides itself on having 365 beaches. Indeed, its complex coastline of safe harbors and a protective wall of coral reef made it attractive to European colonizers. Called Wadadli by the Amerindians, meaning our own, it is said that in 1493, Christopher Columbus may have named it Santa Maria la Antigua, Saint Mary the Ancient. Although the Spaniards did not colonize Antigua, the British settled there from 1632 to 1981, with a brief French interlude in 1666. Sir Thomas Warner was the first governor, and in 1674, Sir Christopher Codrington established the first large sugar estate in Antigua. Along with others, he transformed it into a profitable sugar colony with slave labor. For many years, the island was considered Britain's gateway to the Caribbean. Located on the major sailing routes in the region, in the 18th century, Antigua became the headquarters of the British Royal Navy's Caribbean fleet. Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson commanded the British fleet for much of this time and remains a major figure in Antigua's history. Today, English Harbour on the southeastern coast is the site of the restored naval station called Nelson Dockyard, the only Georgian dockyard in the world. Internationally famous as a yachting and sailing destination, English Harbour is the home of Antigua Sailing Week, one of the premier sailing events in the world. Above the harbour is Shirley Heights, the partially restored fortifications of the harbour's colonial observation post. Along with the rest of the British Empire, Antiguan slaves were emancipated in 1834. However, poor labour conditions continued until 1939 when a member of a royal commission prompted the formation of a trade union movement. As a result, the Antigua Trades and Labour Movement was born. The young Vere Cornwall Bird was elected an executive member, and by 1943 he became its first president. Following 1939, the formation of the Antigua Trades and Labour Union, and you may be aware that throughout the Caribbean you did have this uprising of the 39ers, as we refer to them, who rallied and pushed for a certain degree of independence for the, or self-governance, I should say, for Caribbean people, as well as for the recognition of trade unions in the Caribbean. And in Antigua and Barbuda, we had the formation of the Antigua Trades and Labor Union back in 1939. And that union agitated for a certain level of political freedom for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And so, even though we did have some locals, if I can refer to that, represented in Parliament. They had to have certain property qualifications even to stand for office and even to be registered to vote so that there was not universal suffrage, as we would say. And it wasn't until 1951, if my memory is correct, that the Antigua Trades and Labor Union was able to win that concession from the colonial powers. And we then had uh, universal suffrage where all residents of Antigua and Barbuda, 21 years and older, were entitled to vote. 
By 1946, the ATLU established a political arm called the Antigua Labour Party. Union representatives led by V.C. Byrd won all eight seats in the legislature. This marked the beginning of the Byrd political dynasty. In 1956, a ministerial system of government was introduced, and in the general elections of that year, the Union contested and won all eight elective seats. By 1961, V.C. Byrd was appointed Antigua's first chief minister. Today, he's remembered as the father of the nation. This system stayed in place pretty much until 1967, when we achieved what was referred to then as independence in association with Great Britain, and where certain additional powers were devolved to the local government. In February of 1967, V.C. Byrd was appointed the first Premier of Antigua and Barbuda. Soon after, the ATLU was split, and the Antigua Workers' Union was formed, giving rise to the first significant second party in Antigua. And after we had some strikes, a state of emergency was actually called, if my memory is correct, in March 1968 and there were calls for the resignation of the government. But eventually a compromise was arrived at and it was agreed that there would be by-elections in four constituencies. The Progressive Labour Movement, or PLM, contested all four seats and won those four seats. And so for the first time in Antigua's history, you had persons being elected to parliament who were not members of the ATNLU or ALP. And that basically was the birth of a strong and vibrant second party in Antigua. Eventually, the PLM contested the election, general elections in 1971 and actually won the elections. And so that too was the first full-fledged defeat for the Antigua Labour Party in elective politics in Antigua and Barbuda. The PLM served one term in office and in 1976, the ALP under V.C. Byrd was re-elected to government. After another election victory in 1980, V.C. Byrd sought full independence for Antigua and became the first Prime Minister. Since 1981, Antigua and Barbuda has been a constitutional monarchy with a British-style parliamentary system. As head of state, Queen Elizabeth II is represented by a Governor-General who acts on the advice of the Prime Minister. The government has three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The bicameral legislature consists of a 17-member Senate and a 17-member House of Representatives. Representatives are elected by popular vote in general elections that are constitutionally mandated every five years. Senators are appointed by the Governor-General, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition consult with the Governor-General on the composition of other appointed bodies and commissions. Although Barbuda falls under the auspices of the national government, the Barbuda Local Government Act of 1976 provides for some measure of internal self-government. Current Prime Minister, the Honorable Baldwin Spencer, was a prominent Labour leader for about 25 years. First elected to Parliament in 1989, he was the only member of his party to win a seat. The 1989 election saw a situation where the incumbent government would have won um, 15 of the 17 seats. So they were clearly, totally and completely in control. Uh, on the opposition benches, you had the lone representative, who was myself, who was elected uh, from um, uh, Antigua and from my party in Antigua and the representative from Barbuda was elected on, on the Barbuda People's Movement ticket which traditionally is the group that uh, would win the seat um, uh, in Barbuda. So you had a 15-1-1 situation in, in, in the House of Representatives. I was therefore made uh, leader of the opposition an opposition of two, and it was a coalition at that, uh, yeah, with, with, with Barbuda. Uh, but, you know, looking back, that was the most exciting and, 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 and most challenging 
and at the same time uh, I would regard it as my finest day as a, as, as a member of, of, of Parliament. And some people would argue that the opposition was more effective when you had one individual as against what transpired after 1994 when we had an increase in the numbers and, and, and even when we won the elections eventually in 2004. The 2004 general election was won by the opposition United Progressive Party. This historic election brought an end to the 28-year rule of the Antigua Labour Party. Replacing Lester Byrd, Baldwin Spencer became the first Prime Minister outside of the ALP and the Byrd family. We had one government in place for 28 years and a very small minority at the time, small opposition. And I think that in the public consciousness, the Office of Speaker came to be associated with just another seat, basically, of the government, rightly or wrongly. And so when I came in, I made sure that my primary role was to be neutral, to be objective, and to govern the House according to the rules and not according to any kind of partisan loyalty. Coming to, to government uh, for the first time, we, we had a situation where only one individual would have had some experience, and it wasn't for a very long period of time either. He would have had just about two, three years experience in a, in, in, in a government. And so here you have an entirely new uh, uh, set of individuals administering the, the state of affairs. So the whole question of proving ourselves to be able to govern was one of the, 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 the first challenges that, that we meet. The other thing is that after accumulation of nearly 50 years by a particular regime, you can well imagine dealing with, with, with a public service and all the institutions that go with that would have had its stamp of, of, of that dominance over those years and we had to contend with that. The other thing too was that we have to prove very early that we can in fact govern and of course the opposition uh, was doing everything in its power to try and prove to the people of Antigua and Barbuda that we are incapable of governing. We were able to ride out of that. The other thing that we had to contend with was the state of the economy and, and, and the state of social services as well. One of the things that we did very early in our administration is to address the question of corruption and accountability. And so we, within six months of the new administration, we passed the what we call the trilogy of legislation and it has to do with the prevention of corruption it had to do with um, integrity in public life and it had to do with the freedom of information those two, three pieces of legislation um, were put in place uh, uh, very early and 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 they, they, they're still functional they're, they're operating based on the numbers that we had uh, we were swamped by the UPP government uh, but I think that uh, we did exceptionally well to the extent that you probably would have thought that we had 14 members in the, and I deliberately chose 14 to say that we almost sounded like a majority party even though we had only four elected members so it shows very clearly that um, where you have hard working and committed um, parliamentarians even though their numbers may be small they can be very impactful Returning to the polls in 2009, the UPP won its second term in office as government, but with a reduced majority and suffered a setback which created a constitutional crisis. Well, the 2009 general elections uh, was marred by um, uh, an unfortunate development where, uh, from all indications, the um, electoral commission, the body responsible for the conduct of elections uh, in Antigua and Barbuda, clearly was not prepared and, and we ended up in a situation where there was a very, very late polling in at least five constituencies throughout Antigua and Barbuda, which ended up in a situation where uh, the opposition, those who would have lost, in those constituencies felt constrained in challenging 
the results of those elections. So we ended up in election petition with, with election uh, petition. And clearly, in terms of running the country, getting things done, we lost 19 months of our term because we, we clearly couldn't do very much. Uh, nobody was, uh, was concerned about uh, taking care of certain issues, no investor. Uh, was, was taking us seriously uh, during that period because there was always this question mark. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know if you guys are going to be still the government. We don't know what is going to happen. So therefore, we can't. We can't entreat with you in any serious way. So we had that to contend with. And so Antigua and Barbuda really suffered as a result of that. The 2009 elections came on the heels of the collapse of the Stanford Group. Indeed, billionaire Sir Alan Stanford was the single largest foreign investor in Antigua at the time. Well, I have no doubt that um, the Stanford situation would have contributed. Um, Stanford at the time, or the Stanford Group of Companies, were employing about 800 individuals. And clearly, that would have exacerbated the situation. But we maintain fundamentally that our problem is really a governance problem in that um, notwithstanding the various challenges, the global challenges, the challenges associated with Stanford, even the challenges associated with the attraction of foreign direct investments, we do not support the government's approach that those should be utilized as excuses to justify their failures. We believe that there are opportunities, even in adversity. We have the view that in order to really resolve the economic misfortunes and the various developmental issues that we have, um, poverty issues, issues of um, high um, unemployment, that there needs to be a governance change. And that is why we are working hard. We are making sure that we continue to be very active. In fact, um, I believe that as it stands now, we're easily one of the most active and certainly one of the most vibrant and strongest opposition parties in the Caribbean. Holding firm to its mandate, the opposition has been pursuing a strong legislative agenda. We recognize that one of the fundamental uh, legislative um, uh, amendments that we'll have to make would be to strengthen the Procurement Act, or for that matter, introduce a totally new Procurement Act. We also want to look at issues such as campaign finance reform, which is a fundamental issue. We find, for instance, that the uh, purity and the functionality of our democracy obviously is being affected by campaign finance reform. We want to put some ca controls in place to cap the level of um, political contributions. We also want to make sure that uh, entities that are uh, funders of cap uh, political campaign, that they do not automatically become the beneficiaries of large contracts. According to Senate President, the Honorable Hazelyn Francis, the public follows closely the business of Parliament. We have the public come in, sometimes we invite them, depending on what bill we are going to be debating. And we get requests from them as well. They'd send, some of the schools would send to us if they can come in to, some of them are open, they just want to come in to see a sit-in and we invite that. We always invite the public in, but sometimes, depending on the bill that we are going to be debating, we would invite the our state college students. Sometimes we think that it's geared to them, or sometimes it's just ordinary. We, we can do that. What I have done too is that I have ordered some educational magazines that's just simple, that just tells about Parliament, and I. I've asked the radio station to give a slot so we can come in. I'll give them some questions from time to time that they can ask on their calling programs to see whether or not persons are following and know, especially our young people, whether they know what's going on. So you can be innovative in a number of ways, and there are a number of things that can be done to educate the public. And I'm telling you that our public, they follow. In the lower house, debates take on a more adversarial tone, and Antigua is no exception. When I came into office in 2004, there were only four members on the opposition bench, and I think they thought they had to work two or three times as hard to um, remind the 
public that there was an opposition and so it got quite rowdy and unruly at times. Um, one member in particular. And so he and I had several run-ins and I think, um, I think twice I had to suspend him for the rest of the day. And um, in the last, um, after the last election, when the former prime minister returned to office, he returned in feisty fashion. And so we clashed early in the, in the day. He reminded me that he was a lawyer. He'd been a prime minister and deputy prime minister. And he had been making legislation when I was a little girl. You know, so he thought that I should um, show some more respect for his stature. And um, I had to remind him that I was not a little girl anymore and that I was the Speaker of the House and according to the rules he'd gone too far. So I had to invite him to leave for the rest of the day too. Since then we've had a very cordial relationship. And then um, last year, Mr. Brown, um, we had a little contretemps and he was suspended for the rest of the parliamentary session. He had to be named and so he had to sit out the rest of the parliamentary session because I thought he had been grossly disrespectful to the house, to the mace, and uh, I had to rule accordingly. Like many countries in the region, Antigua has been faced with questions about the relevance of the Westminster system. We do not practice the Westminster system in its entirety. Uh, we practice um, variations of it. The Westminster system calls for a strong component of standing committees of parliament, select committees of parliament, and a number of other things that would make for transparency and a greater degree of accountability within the parliamentary system. Now, I know for, for the case of Antigua and Barbuda, those things are not in place. They're seldom used. Uh, the parliamentary system that we have practiced over the years um, has, has, has worked reasonably well. Um, I don't think that we have been able to maximize the benefits because um, I believe it has a lot to do um, uh, with our smallness and so on. I mean, the system that was bequeathed to us envisaged, you know, a, a larger society with a lot of things and, 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 and we don't have the, the financial or the way of it all to, to have those kinds of institutions and mechanisms uh, fully in place to make for uh, a well-oiled uh, um, Westminster-type parliamentary system. For a regular business meeting, I'll wear a business suit. And um, when it's a, like the throne speech and so on, then I'll wear a more um, ornate kind of a, a affair. Then I'll wear like a hat and, and things like that and gloves if necessary. But we do not wear the, um, the traditional gown and, and wig. Speaker Isaac Arundel also notes the value of being a part of the Commonwealth. One of the hugest challenges of being Speaker is that there's no training for a Speaker. I mean, you get a call one day and ask you to be Speaker and you say yes, and then, and then you're sworn in and you're Speaker. Nobody goes to school to learn this stuff. And so um, you kind of learn on your own, you learn on your feet, you have to be very quick in um, understanding the standing orders, understanding the implications of the law and so on. And so I think that one of the um, institutions that I have to praise is the CPA, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, which has different fora, region, regional, for, there are regional forums and there are um, forums for speakers and well presiding officers as well as the uh, big plenary sessions where you get to meet with your colleagues and you kind of learn from them because they're your teachers. Everybody, nobody's right, nobody's wrong, but at least you get to hear each other's experiences. Because as similar as we are, we're all different. And so I like to go to meetings, especially of the region, where I can say, this is what happened in Antigua, how would you have handled it? Or we heard so-and-so happened in Trinidad, you know, and this is similar. And you kind of bounce ideas off each other and you get this kind of intellectual richness. And um, I think that is, that's one of the things that we do very well and it builds a sense of camaraderie and support for the parliamentary system that otherwise we don't have. With a history of hard-fought elections and peaceful changes of government, Antigua and Barbuda look toward the future. It's still a relatively young democracy, uh, parliamentary democracy, and um, clearly we're going to have to do some things differently. We have to make some um, <clears throat> cultural changes in terms of the way we do business. And I don't mean this in terms of a cliché of um, 
and not having business as usual, but fundamentally committing ourselves to doing things differently. What I would like to see us do in Antigua and Barbuda in Parliament is to be less partisan and more patriotic. I think sometimes um, we play to the gallery, we play to our constituents, and we say things we don't even believe, things we don't even mean, because it's what's expected, um, either as a government side or an opposition side, rather than looking at the fact that we're here to make laws for the entire country, both those who support us and those who don't. And we're making laws for ourselves when we're not in government. Another thing I'd like us to do is um, work together as a branch. We are the Antigua and Barbuda branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, FIPA, whatever. And so I think I would like us to make a greater effort to work as a nation. I'd like to see us become a more professional parliament rather than a, a partisan one. I mean, we haven't done um, too badly in, in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, you know, when we look back, that Antigua and Barbuda in, 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 in the 1950s and 40s was considered one of the poorest countries in the entire Caribbean. The, the figures are there, the statistics are there. Uh, we, 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 have, we have really pulled ourselves up uh, to a very great extent by our, our own bootstraps. But the reality is that we have to build on that and we have to be seen because the demands by the people are great. I said that we are an open economy. We're influenced by what happens in North America and elsewhere. I mean, uh, um, the world is shrinking as we speak, but it's not necessarily shrinking, shrinking in our favor. But we have to respond to that and to be able to deal with it um, in, a, in an effective way. Finally, I would say that as we move forward individually, as member states in the, in, 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 in the Caribbean, I think we have to recognize that our survival is dependent upon how best we are able to collaborate. Antigua and Barbuda, moving ahead as a parliamentary democracy.